So thank you very much for this very beautiful introduction of which the beauty even remained in English translation. I should also thank the organizers of this festival for the opportunity to talk to you here about the project that we have been carrying on in Leiden over the past few years concerning the print gallery of Escher. Some of you may have been at a movie that was shown the day before yesterday. Now let me just go to a dark spot of the stage so that I can see you. Who went to the movie the day before yesterday? And who did not? Okay, so then you may fail the test at the end. The present lecture will complement the movie from Jean Bergeron that some of you saw on Friday. He treated partly the same subject as the current lecture, but in my lecture I will discuss more of the mathematical background. But it is mathematics of a special sort. It is mathematics without formulas. If you are one of those for whom mathematics only has meaning with formulas, then you have an interesting exercise, namely, from what I say, deduce the formulas, which should be routine for such persons. Escher, I think by now you have gotten a good introduction to him, a Dutch graphic artist who was mostly active during the 20s, the 30s, the late 30s he started with his work that was more of a nature that appeals to mathematicians and scientists. This is his day and night from 1938, a woodcut which clearly shows you not just the difference between Escher and other artists, but also the difference between the Netherlands and Italy. Here is a, maybe a more typical Escher. It is one of those infinite repetitions that he is known for. And maybe some of you on the front row can see that I am wearing a tie of a similar pattern. Infinite repetitions of a linear sort, as my introducer remarked. This is not even an official work of art that he made. This is just from his sketchbooks. It shows you fish that repeat in all sorts of ways. And you will, in fact, in the print gallery print that I will be showing you, see a similar repetition in a more hidden nature. Now, before I get to the print gallery, I am showing you another typical work. This is from the early 60s, a waterfall showing the impossible triangle. And this already shows to you that mathematics can be seen in the works of Escher in at least two different ways. First of all, Escher himself would need mathematical notions, mathematical ideas to conceive of his prints and to execute them. But it is also true on the point of the viewer that if you see through the mathematical structure, then it will add to your enjoyment of the print. Here is something that we got from the internet, an animation that shows that the water really flows. Here is print gallery that is the main subject of my lecture. It is a lithograph that Escher made in 1956. If you do not know what a lithograph is, lithos, that is Greek, that means stone. A lithograph is printed from a stone. Here you see the original stone. The same representation is on there in mirror image. That is the way it happens with printing. This is a picture taken in the attic of an American Escher collector. As you also see, there is a big white cross drawn across the stone that is in order to prevent from uh, any further copies from being printed. This always happens at the death of an artist. The wood blocks that he printed, the woodcuts from, they get a few big holes and the stones for the lithographs, they get a cross. It is called print gallery and in fact you see here this print gallery which you enter at the lower right, and if your eye goes to the left, then everything is 
expanding. In fact, if you check the Escher literature, then you will see that Escher attempted to express in this print the idea of the circular expansion. And indeed, if you go around the center the clockwise, then everything seems to be expanding. There is sort of a small person standing here in the gallery, and here's a young guy, which is much larger. Also, the print that he is looking at, it expands as you go up. The print itself that he is looking at is a view of Malta, a woodcut that Escher made on one of his many travels in the 30s. And the buildings, the houses in the seaport, they again expand if you continue your clockwise journey and then you go down along the right side, then you discover that one of the buildings is the very same gallery that you entered at the beginning. So it may be said here that this young man on the left is looking at a print on which he is himself shown. One of the typical paradoxes that Escher's work are popular for. And in order to make this all possible, at least so people think, there is this empty spot in the middle that has been discussed a lot. Maybe we should take a closer look. You see that Escher put his signature there. You see here the number two. The stone was printed in three series, of which is the second series, consisting of 47 copies. This was number 20 of 47. Escher liked this particular print, so he signed it. That was added to the print after it was printed. Here you see the monogram and the dating that is drawn on the stone. And one of the questions that I will be considering is to which extent this empty spot in the middle is really unavoidable. Some people say it is not a beautiful spot. Well, in mathematics, we do not decide about ugly or beautiful. What I will consider is not whether it is beautiful or not, but whether it is necessary or not. And in order for you to appreciate the difference between this artistic beauty on the one hand and the mathematical necessity on the other, I should maybe remark that the question of filling in the print towards the inside turns out to be essentially equivalent to the question of filling in the print towards the outside. That is, from a mathematical point of view, not very different. And you can ask yourself the question whether there is a natural way to continue the print up, down, left and right. I do not think that in artistic circles a print is considered ugly just because it is bounded. Limitless works of art <coughs> would be very hard to sell, and that is maybe why Escher made those circle limits that we saw in the course of the introduction. So I will be talking about the mathematical structure of the print especially with a view towards understanding this empty space in the middle. Now, Escher's studies give us some tools for understanding this. This is a picture that you see in much of the Escher li literature. This is a study, this is totally unique. It, this uh, original belongs to the collection of the same American collector where the, the stone is sitting in the attic. And from a mathematical point of view, one might almost say that this is the more interesting object to look at. One thing that one can certainly say about it is that it is more informative. For example, on the print, it was quite clear that there was indeed a circular expansion, but in this grid you can also make this quantitative. For example, if you look at this little square here, well, it is maybe not a perfect square, but it is a good approximation to a square. You see one that is essentially exactly as large as you measure it over here. But if you look what happens to these squares, this is, if, if they are deformed one to the next, they are getting gradually larger. And by the time that you are sort of halfway on the way to the other corner, it is getting so large that Escher is applying a subdivision, and you see that this big square, which is really four times four times the original square, 
is really just a deformed version of the square that we started from. So the expansion factor, if you go from this area of the print to over here, that is an expansion factor of four in each direction. And the same happens if you go up along the left side, that is a factor of four times four, which is 16. Another four here, that makes 64. And finally, when you're back to where you started, everything has been expanded by a factor of four to the power of four, which is 256. Here you see the back side of the same study, which answers an interesting question that you may have wondered about, since the grid that I showed you a moment ago really has the same orientation as the print, whereas Escher really, to draw it on the stone, would need something that was in the mirror image. But he used transparent paper for all these studies, so he could use the backside as well. In fact, as you know Dutch, this word, achterkant, that means backside. Here you see some of the people who were involved in the project. Bart de Smit was mentioned by the introducer. He visited Rome not so long ago. If you like the pictures that you will be seeing during the rest of my lecture, then you should be as thankful to him as I am because he made essentially all of them. Bruno Ernst, he wrote a book called The Magic Mirror of M.C. Escher, which gives some of the mathematical background and which was very instrumental to us in understanding the mathematical structure. Joost Batenburg, he was at the time a, f a freshman, a beginning student, helping us with all of the computer programming. Hans Richter and Jacqueline Hofstra, they are the artists because, after all, we wanted to fill in a hole and we cannot do that without artistic help. And Willem-Jan Palenstein, he was our computer guru who in particular made this nice pointer for me. Okay, so that is the credits that should go with my presentation as well. As I mentioned, my lecture will be largely without formulas. If you do like to see the formulas, here is the reference. Go to your library. Make sure that they have a copy of the notices of the American Mathematical Society from April of 2003, and you will see the connection of my subject to elliptic curves, as well as all the formulas that you would ever need. Here is an alternative title for my lecture, Escher and the Droste Effect, because the Droste Effect, well, it sounds like something from physics, but in a few minutes you will know that it has nothing to do with physics, but it is, in a sense, a phenomenon that if you think hard enough about it, it will tell you all about the Escher print. So what I will do next is give you a brief introduction to the Droste effect. Droste is the name of a Dutch cocoa brand, and this is the design that they have been using for their packages of cocoa since more than 100 years. It's a nurse, and the nurse holds a tray. On the tray, there is another package, and if your eyes are not good enough, I can zoom in so that you see what is happening here. So that is the Drost effect, a real triumph of the Dutch color printing industry. <laughs> and Drost effect is a word that, is, that has really entered the Dutch language. Here you have a newspaper clipping from the financial page of one of the leading Dutch newspapers. It says Drost effect in the stock exchange. And the news item refers to the fact that the German stock exchange is going to be quoted in the stock exchange. And the reporter makes a comparison to a dentist drawing his own teeth. So the Droste effect is in a figurative way used for anything that refers to itself. I do not know a similar word 
in any other language but Dutch. If you want to enrich your own beautiful language, I offer it for free. Il effetto droste, I would guess. <laughs> you may just use it the rest of your existence. But even though the word may be unique to the Dutch language, the concept is certainly not unique. Here is the butter that I used when I lived in California, the Land O Lakes. I should maybe mention that this lecture is not sponsored by Land O Lakes. <laughs> the effect is essentially the same. There is no nurse but a Native American lady. There are a few differences that you will come to appreciate in the course of this lecture. One of them is that the zoom in factor is a little larger. The Droste effect, you have to zoom in by a factor of about six and a half before it repeats. Here it is almost 15. Another difference that you may come to appreciate is that in the Lando Lakes, the vanishing point, the point that you zoom into, that is pretty much in the middle of the picture, whereas in the Droste picture, it is on the edge, and that will make a big difference. Here is an example that is a, again a little different. It's, it is from France. It is a brand of cheese, La Vacherie, the laughing cow. And you also see why the cow is laughing, because on her ear is hanging a package of the same cheese. Now, the big difference here is that the original package is round, and this is just an ellipse. So we did something about this because we like, in this lecture, conformality. We like the shape to be unchanged. So we tilted the package slightly so that now the shapes are indeed the same. This is oval, which will used to be round. This is, again, oval, but uh, one might say a little less sharply so than on the previous image. And the big difference is that the thing has been turned over 90 degrees. You also see that this package seems to be lying on some sort of a brown reddish pillow. If you are interested in knowing what this pillow really is, let's zoom out for a change rather than zoom in. And then you see that this package is not really so easy to get in the supermarket. You have to fight with a cow over it. My next Droste example, you can tell that in Leiden we have been doing nothing else over the past few years than collecting Droste pictures. <laughs> that is a cruise ship, and it is a little bit different in two ways. First of all, you don't really see it is a Droste picture. I will show you why it is in a moment. But the real reason we made this example is that we were interested in the question whether it is necessary for one of these Droste images to contain in itself a picture that repeats. The picture of the box of cocoa, the picture of the cheese, the picture of the butter. This is an example of a Droste effect without a picture shown in the image. And maybe you can already see some hints where the Droste effect is hiding. You see these dark shades here. They are actually part of a contraption to climb out of the ocean. And here you see a reddish glow on the lower right corner that is, as you will see in a moment, a sea monster. So here the zoom in factor is so large that you do not see it with the naked eye without actually using an animation. It is about 10 times as large as the one for the Vashkiri. The Vashkiri, the laughing cow, had a zoom in factor of about 23, at the same time turning over 90 degrees. Here it is almost 230. Now you might start wondering what this all has to do with my subject, the print gallery of Escher. 
And that question is answered if you again go back to the attic of the American collector and look at the studies that Escher prepared for making this lithograph. Here you see the first study, and it is a study of a perfectly straight print gallery. And what Escher would do is that using the grid that I showed earlier with the curved lines, he would deform all of the straight squares according to the grid, one by one, in order to produce the representation on the final lithograph. So all these little straight squares, they will become curved, and this curved line that you see here, that will become straight, that is actually the outside boundary of the print. And this particular study contained enough detail for Escher to finish the bottom part of the print, underkant it says, so that is the lower right angle. For this section, he had an additional study that was four times as large, and that is my next picture. You see it is not completely faithful to the final lithograph. This is the place where the young man is standing, and here you see the print that he is looking at. And the print that he is looking at, well, you need more detail, so that gives study number three. That is copied from the woodcut that Escher made in the 30s when he was traveling on Malta. Study number four, which is again blown up from this one by a factor of four, shows you more details of the buildings over here. That is this one. And inside this one, one of the buildings deserves more detail. So study number five is actually identical to study number one. And each of these studies that I show to you is contained in the previous one, except then that it is blown up by a factor of four. So that means that, in particular, this first study contains itself, except that it is a really minuscule copy. It is sitting somewhere here. It is four times four times four times four times as small, so it is 256 times as small. So here you see, without zooming in, Again, an example of a Droste picture. If you want to see it with the animation as you saw it for the cruise ship, well, then you need to consult the artists. That is what we did. We had the artists complete these pictures and add the grayscales, and then you see a somewhat cleaned up version, and that is, just as with the cruise ship, a Droste effect that becomes visible when you zoom in. By the time you have zoomed in over a factor of 256, you are exactly back at where you started. The material that you are staring at now is exactly based on the original in print gallery, except that if you take whatever you see in the original lithograph and you straighten it up in the format of these studies, then it turns out that there are certain empty spirals. So if I stop this for a moment, then you will see several elements. For example, this British tourists, tourist and this palm tree and those buildings that are not in the original. And in fact, there is also an original print that we added since there was room for a print here. So one of our artists put there his favorite Escher print, which is the Möbius strip, which you can admire in the uh, Escher exhibition here. The other artist who was involved in the project, she became very nervous about this because she discovered that Möbius strip was made several years after print gallery. So this is an anachronism which is impossible, but clearly, if we like Escher, we like things that are impossible. So that is the <laughs> first Droste effect as it is hidden, if not in print gallery itself, then at least in the studies that 
Escher used when he made print gallery. So there you have five examples from many more of the Droste effect. And here I have a little table for each of the five. I give you the scaling factor, the factor by which you have to zoom in before the picture repeats, which is six and a half. It is almost 15, 23, but that is simultaneously turning over an angle of 90 degrees. And I write 90 degrees as pi over two here because we mathematicians like to measure our angles in terms of radians, for which there is actually a very good reason in the present context, as we will become clear later in my lecture. The cruise ship was almost 230, and I think by now you recognize the number 256 in the connection of Escher. Okay, now the next thing that I would like to discuss is a practical difficulty that you face when you become a collector of Droste effects, as we have become in Leiden, and if you want to show them to people. And to explain this problem, which is really a problem of computer graphics, I would like to show you the typical structure of a computer screen, and that is just many dots. And the basic thing here is that these dots are uniformly distributed across the screen. There is not a point where you have a higher resolution available. And if you like to collect and to show Droste effects, then you really like there to be a point in the middle where you have much more information available and you would like to have a computer with a screen of which the structure is much more like the one that I am showing next. Higher resolution in the middle so that you have the same amount of information available when you keep zooming in. And that is a real problem that you face when you collect Droste effects and the way that we solved it was by following a proverb that we have in Holland, which translated into English reads that if the mountain doesn't come to the prophet, then the prophet should come to the mountain. And in our case, if we cannot adapt the screens to our pictures, then we should adapt the pictures to our screens or maybe rather to our computer memories which are arranged in the same way. So here you see typically a section of a picture that we want to show or that we want to store in our computer. And here you have the way we store it. So you see that there are here seven radii emerging from an imaginary center that is sitting here and they are transformed into seven horizontal lines. So the vertical direction here that measures the angle as seen from this origin. And what we do is that we store our pictures like this. And if we want to show them, then for every point over here, we recompute the corresponding point here. For example, this point here, it is the middle row and the second column, so that is this point, and we check what color it has before we show it on the screen. So more concretely, here you see a section of the Droste package. That is the way I showed it to you. And here is the way that we have it stored in our computer. And you see that the big difference between the two representations is that here, then you look at the repeating elements of the picture, the, the nurse in this case, and here the repetition does not involve a change of scale. They are exactly of the same size, whereas here they are blown up by a factor of six and a half.
picture that you saw already, and on the left side, you have the logarithm. So if you now, for example, zoom in, as I did before, then you see that in the logarithmic world, you are just shifting. As I mentioned, if you go twice as far from the origin, you shift in the logarithmic world by the logarithm of two. So that is the Droste effect in this picture is translated in the logarithmic world in our computer memory, it is translated into a horizontal repetition. You see also a vertical repetition here, and that vertical repetition that has nothing to do with the Droste effect, that is just something that you have with any picture in the world. If you turn it around completely, then the picture repeats. That is not much of a surprise. So the vertical repetition that you see in the logarithmic world corresponds to a distance which is 360 degrees, which is uh, 2 pi when we measure it in radians. This 2 pi, you will hear more about it in this lecture. You also see an interesting phenomenon here. Maybe I should put it still for a moment. Here the vanishing point is here at the edge of the picture. That means in the logarithmic world that there is a half a band that is totally red. If you position yourself in the vanishing point and you look around you, then half of what you see is a big red C. Or whatever is red, maybe it is the C in hell. So here is the complete logarithmic space. You see the repetition a little bit more indefinitely than in the previous picture. So the vertical representation, the vertical distance, that is the 2 pi. Let me just show the abstract repetition pattern. The vertical repetition is 2 pi, which is about 6.3. The horizontal repetition, that is the logarithm of the zoom-in factor. The zoom-in factor is about 6.5. The logarithm is almost 1.9. Okay, so that should help you understand the relation between the Droste picture and the logarithmic world. Here is the example of the length of lakes, and uh, it is not really very uh, different. You can zoom in. Here you see that on the left there is much more to be seen because the vanishing point is in the middle here. Also the zoom in factor is a little larger, so the horizontal repetition takes a little bit more time before it materializes on the left. I can also turn it around. In fact, I can sort of make a combination of turning around and zooming in, playing with this Native American lady. And then you see that you are sort of going diagonally up in the logarithmic space, increasing simultaneously the angle and the zoom in factor. Here is the wallpaper pattern that goes with it. It should definitely remind you of the repetitive Escher pictures, the repeating pattern. Here is the abstract structure showing the qualitative nature of these repetitions. The 2 pi, which you have with any picture at all in the world, corresponds to turning it around. Here you have a horizontal period, as mathematicians express it. It is now a bit larger. It is a logarithm of this number that was almost 15. It is about 2.7. Let me pass to the cruise ship. The cruise ship has a much larger zoom in factor, so you do not even see the repetition in the logarithmic space. And of course, again, in the dangerous waters around Malta, you can play with the boat and you can go to the wallpaper pattern and you see that now the horizontal distance is indeed much larger than before. The vertical distance, so here we have the stern of the boat, and there we have the, the, the poop, I guess it's called. So this distance is the 2 pi again, and the diagram that goes with it gives me a lattice of periods, as mathematicians say, that looks a little bit more in balance 
this logarithm of 227, which is more than 5, comes close to this 2 pi, which is about 6.3. And we have something very similar with the Escher picture. Here we have the Escher picture in which you can zoom in. Our award-winning wallpaper pattern is on the left. And that is what it looks like in full screen. I usually orient myself using the head of this viewer. So this distance is 2 pi, about 6.3. This distance is the logarithm of 256, which is about 5.5. So there you see the precise numbers. That gives you four out of my collection. The laughing cow I left out because it is a little bit special, but it is still interesting to see what happens. Because in this case, there is in the wallpaper pattern simultaneously a, uh, well, you have to represent both the zoom in factor and the rotation. It is not just a straight zoom in, but at the same time you rotate, you turn it around over 90 degrees, over pi over 2. So in the period lattice, that means that if you zoom in over a factor of about 23, then you shift by 3.1. And at the same time, you turn over pi over 2, which is a quarter of the total 2 pi. So this is what you would expect the repetition pattern in the wallpaper to look like. And this is the actual wallpaper. And you see indeed that this repetition is like that. So you don't have a horizontal repetition. You have a horizontal repetition, but you have to go up by a quarter of the vertical period. If you really want to have a, a horizontal period, you have to wait for four cows until it is really horizontal. So here you see the two pictures side by side again. And you see that you have to make a diagonal shift in the logarithmic space to make this possible. You can also try to go to shift horizontally. And then you see that at every repetition, the box of cheese rotates over 90 degrees. So that completes my table of logarithms. In the case of the first theory, <laughs> we need to have a complex logarithm where you have an imaginary part, which is a half pi times the imaginary unit i, which is the square root of minus 1. So that is the mathematics that is behind all these pictures, the qualitative data. OK, so there we have the explanation of the Droste effect. And I am now coming to a story that is a little bit different. And that is a problem that you run into when you deal with the Droste effect as we have been doing it in Leiden. And this is a difficulty that is most easily illustrated by first looking at a much simpler print, which is not a Droste print, and that is the snakes. That is a woodcut that Escher made in 1968. I believe it is his last work. And even though there is no repetition, there is nothing that would prevent us from taking the logarithm. And then you see that you have here these snakes. There is a repetition of three snakes before you go around. And here you have this vertical period. There is nothing horizontal happening because it is not a Droste picture. And the 2 pi that you have, that is really this distance from one snake's head to the third one after it. That is a distance of 2 pi. So if I turn this around, then you will see that when your first, the first snake's head returns to its original position, then on the left, the snake has shifted by three positions. So if you do what we do in Leiden, then 
we don't store the right half of the print in our computer. All that we have available is this representation. And in order to show the snakes, we have to recompute, we have to use these logarithms. But now suppose that in a few hundred years, there is a flourishing branch of scholarship which is called computer archaeology. And computer archaeology that consists of digging up old tapes of people and old pe pieces of computer memory and looking what is in there. And then these computer archaeologists, long after everybody here in Rome and Leiden died, they will see this picture and they will see, aha, that is the logarithm of snakes. But suppose that we forgot to tell these computer archaeologists what 2 pi was. Maybe they thought that 2 pi was not just three distances, but that it was four distances. Then if they would reconstruct the woodcut of Escher, they would get the following version. And that would not be historically very accurate. And of course, four is a very arbitrary number here. Maybe they thought there were going to be five snakes or six or here you have even 12, and you can even go to infinity, then you are back at the logarithms. You can also have fewer snakes, maybe there are just two. You should keep in mind here that the snakes that you are seeing here, they were made by Escher, and what we did to them was just process them on a computer. We just killed one of the snakes by pushing a button, and we can kill another one, and here's only one snake <laughs> left. Now, I cannot kill them all, zero snakes, that is not part of the game, but I can actually have a negative number of snakes by putting the whole strip upside down. And then what do you get? Well, here you have minus three snakes, and you have minus six snakes, minus two snakes, and there you have my favorite negative snake, which does need to be fed, however. So, this shows that if you are storing pictures like we do with our Droster pictures, it is important to keep track of the information which of your repetitions is the 2 pi. And for example, if our computer archaeologist discovers this repetitive pattern of the cows, well, he doesn't know what we know, that this is the 2 pi. Maybe he thinks that this is the 2 pi. And it is interesting to see what happens. So here you see our lattice diagram. This is the 2 pi, but maybe when he digs it up from under the mud, he <laughs> turns it around a little, and he thinks that this is the 2 pi, so that in the wallpaper pattern, that has the effect of turning the thing like this. So this is the original one, and that is so to speak, the misunderstanding where now this distance is 2 pi. So going back to the periods, here we had our previous 2 pi, and then here we had that rotation, but now we have the new top 2 pi, and then that would predict that you get a Droster picture that has a zoom-in factor, which is equal to this distance, which is, well, the logarithm is that distance, so it becomes about 47, and there's a slight angle, it is not a counterclockwise angle, but it's a clockwise one with 27 degrees. And if you see what that means in practice, then you have one of these Walt Disney characters. Looks a little bit, bit like Dumbo. <laughs> but it is, in a sense, Walt Disney combined with Escher, since this Dumbo has a package of cheese hanging on one of his ears, and on that package of cheese, you see there is a picture of that same Dumbo that you started from. So it is just like a person looking at a gallery, looking in a gallery at a print that displays himself. Here we have an animal, and it is sitting on the label of a package of cheese hanging from its very own ear. So that might make you curious what happens if we do the same thing with our 
wallpaper pattern for Azure. So here you have my 2Pi, and you might think that the real 2Pi is that one. So in the diagram, you would transform the diagram so that this line here becomes vertical and of length equal to that length, which is 2Pi. So in the picture, that would mean that you that this rectangle that you see here becomes tilted, and now that rectangle is sitting here, and the new 2 pi is this vertical distance here. So in the diagram, you still see the right angles, but now you get the new 2 pi that predicts a zoom-in factor of a little over 22, combined with a quite substantial rotation. And that gives a very interesting variant of the Escher print, which from a qualitative point of view is similar. You see a guy looking at a print, and on the print there are buildings, and one of the buildings is the building that the guy is himself standing in. But the whole story unfolds itself counterclockwise rather than clockwise. So that is clearly not identical, even remotely, to the true Escher. But then, of course, we have a lot of freedom. Instead of deciding this diagonal to be our 2 pi, we can decide on the other one. So that means in our wallpaper pattern that we now tilt our rectangle in the other direction so that this one becomes vertical, so there you have it. So our original 2 pi was sitting, let's see, where is this gentleman standing? That is, here he is. So here we have our original 2 pi, and there we have our new one. Here we have our original log of 256, and that is now the logarithm of some other complex number. Here it is, it corresponds to a zoom in by 22 and a half and turning it almost completely upside down, simultaneously turning it over about 160 degrees. So that gives you our version of the Escher print, which if you compare it with the original Escher print, really strikes you by its structural similarity, and even in the details, if you sort of look at the main part of the print, the two are remarkably similar. There are also some differences. One difference is, of course, the middle. In our, the middle is filled in. I will show you a little bit more in the middle in a moment. But also towards the outside, there's a difference. If you look at the original print, you see the curves of these lines towards the outside. This is first convex, and then it is concave. Also here, this line here, it is first convex, and then it becomes concave. If you look at our own version, it is the other way around. It is first concave and then convex. So you see that Escher stayed a little bit further away from our own model towards the edges of the print. He may have had good artistic reasons for it. For example, the columns of this print gallery, well, Malta is in an earthquake-sensitive region, as I said before. In the Escher print, these columns are much more stable. They are essentially vertical. Now, you may also want to see what is happening in the middle, and for that purpose, let's just zoom in. And then you see that in a completely seamless way, everything repeats, we blow up, we zoom in by a factor of 22.4, and at the same time there is a counterclockwise rotation over an angle of 158 degrees, and everything repeats completely. Some people think that this is a good screensaver. 
But I should warn you, we have a guest book on our website, and one of the entries reads, reads I stared at this for 10 minutes. Then I went to bed with a heavy headache. <laughs> okay, now. <clears throat> This is uh, not the end of it, although I am very happy with the applause, of course. But let me go back to the period diagram. The first two pi that I tried was that one. The next one was this. Well, you can also try that one. There are infinity many pictures in this grid that you can show. And it is interesting to look at several of the effects that you get. Here you see a new version of the print gallery that contains all the same elements. Now, there are some differences. You have this frame that spirals towards the middle. You have two of them. It's an interesting exercise given the version that I'm showing to decide which two pi it corresponds to. Here you have an interesting one that tells you the meaning of the word ramification point in mathematics. This is what happens when you square the picture, when you pull it back by squaring in the parlance of mathematicians. This is actually something that you can do with any picture. It doesn't need to be a droster picture. This is similar to what I did with the snakes. An eight-sided print here, but there is the repetition. There we have our opera ceiling. One of my friends made this, thought that this reminded him of the Paradiso of Dante. Somehow I feel that this one qualifies for being used with more color. I think it is now getting time to fasten your seat belts because this is one that looks a little surreal this is a true Droste picture where the new 2 pi is the original horizontal period, the 256. This is a Droste picture where the enlargement factor, the zoom in factor, is more than 1200. That means that you have to wait a long time before things repeat. But during that wait, you will see everything that occurs in the original picture, although you may have to turn your head once in a while. This one is not nearly as dreadful as my last one. La chat on ye speranza voi cantati. Interesting to see the many circles here. That is a, this is the inverse map on the complex plane. And the, and Möbius inversions, they send lines to circles. Here you saw one that I showed before, the counter Escher. Now animated, you see it just repeats as before. It is in a sense as convincing, although the best one is the one where you see the regular patterns that Escher picked himself. And that is where I would like to and my lecture. I thank you very much for your attention. Ringraziamo il professor Lenstra, se ci sono delle domande. E ci sa un traduttore. Comunque io eh, ripeto la domanda al professore in inglese. Quindi. E c'è qualcuno che porta il microfono, credo? Uh, devo parlare in inglese? Uh, no, you, se la fa in italiano, uh, gli altri capiscono, comunque dobbiamo avere le due cose. Okay. 
Uh, I'll do it first in English. Uh, I don't know which kind of uh, cocoa we used to uh, eat uh, um, Asher, but I'm quite sure of what kind of biscuits he used, he used <laughs> in Italy. Because in Italy, we have a, a factory that is called Gentilini that makes a, um, a brand with a, with a train that does a, 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 band, a double band with uh, the, the logos, uh, which is always the same train. So it's, uh, it's uh, quite a complex uh, uh, formula for, for your collection of, uh, of draws effects. Oh, well, thank you very uh, I much. Will, I will send you, I will send you the, the, the logo. Or, I, unfortunately, today is, is, uh, the, the supermarkets are closed. Otherwise, I would, I would buy you a, 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 because it's still in, in use and it's an old, an old factory. So it's probably could be useful for you. And it's a Roman factory. No, thank you very much. I will be happy uh, to... Can I make a translation? I will be happy to eat the biscuits and take the logarithm of the package. Ci sono altre domande? C'è qua qualcuno. Grazie, professore. Thank you, professor, for your kind lesson. And um, I refer to the two snake version you may you have shown before. Mi riferisco alla versione dei due serpenti. And I could see a painting which title is uh, What about your husband, uh, Mefrau Hesher, Mrs. Hesher, where the snakes. The body, the body of the snakes were changed with the stairways. I don't know if you could see this kind of picture. It was exposed in Spain during the International Congress of Mathematicians in August 2006. If you don't know, I suggest you to, to okay. see it. Okay, well, thank you very thank much. Thank you, Professor. Uh, thank you for that comment. I was not aware of this, but I will look into it. Thank you very much. C'è bisogno di tradurre queste, non so se... Okay. Ce l'avete? Credo che abbiamo tempo... Okay. Se c'è una domanda lì in fondo, se la persona che ha il microfono... E qua davanti le vedo. Scusate, mi tolgo, ecco, così vi vedo meglio. Eh, volevo chiedere se questo effetto eh, Drost non è poi quello che si ritrova in natura con i frattali. Chiede se... Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> He's asking whether this drost effect is the same that you find in nature with fractals. Ah, yeah, so um, there is certainly a parallel. I do think that there is an essential difference between the drost effect and most of the repetitions that you see in fractals, and that is that in the drost effect, the repetition is really happening in the neighborhood of one point, whereas with fractals you have typically repetitions everywhere. C'è stata una traduzione di questo, credo, vero? Ok. Allora... Salutiamo il professor Lenz, lo ringraziamo ancora.